But what's super cool about breathing is that you can also consciously hijack any response and yeah. you can actually manipulate the way your body is responding through altering the length of your inhale, the length of your exhale, and the gaps in between inhale and exhale. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, some of the most common and, and easy to do practices are that you're just attempting to expand your exhale so that it's longer than your inhale, because typically exhales are extremely stress relieving. Um, mm -hmm. And it allows some of the parasympathetic aspects of your nervous system to come online. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other ways to manipulate and, and play around with inhale so that that can also happen. But basically, you can adjust the dial of your breathing to have a state change. That's yeah. just amazing. <laughs> Welcome to the Zero Quit Podcast, where we bring you inside the minds of elite athletes, business owners, specialists, and other creatives. I'm your host, Brock Covington, and through these conversations, you'll hear practical advice and effective strategies for optimizing not only your performance, but also your habits and routines as well. If you enjoy the show, be sure to subscribe and share it with a friend. What's going on, guys? Today, I have the pleasure of talking to Miss Jill Miller. She's a certified yoga therapist, teacher, co-founder of Tune Up Fitness, author of The Role Model, and most importantly, at least relevantly, author of the upcoming book, Body by Breath. How are you doing? Oh, I'm so great. And it's actually Mrs. Jill Miller, so I'll just add that. Okay, little... Mrs., Mrs., sorry. I already, <laughs> I always get twisted up with the Miss and Mrs., right? Because it's like yeah. it's written one way, pronounced another. Yeah, there you go. Correct me Right, on that. right. MRS. I'm like, how? It's like, what? How did that yeah, MRS exactly. become a Mrs.? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> My husband will be it. happy to hear that I'm a Mrs., okay? Yeah, yeah. So as we were kind of talking about before the podcast, this book has been a long time coming. So I don't know if you want to kind of introduce, I guess, Actually, you know, before we get to the book, sure. let's get into your origins with yoga, how you got into yoga and like the whole fitness uh, industry overall. Okay. How I got into the fitness industry. We, I grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, off the grid in a solar home. So in the 1970s, which mm -hmm. is long before you were born, um, President Carter at the time had given people major incentives to go solar. And so my mother and her husband at the time were extremely uh, forward thinking and very optimistic about solar and the solar industry. And so we moved mm -hmm. out to Santa Fe. They started a solar, a solar business. And we actually lived in a all solar community. It was one of two on the planet at the time. Yeah. And um, lived in a solar home that was, you know, built into the earth and had a berm. And, you know, we, we had a wood stove and... Um, the problem with living in a solar home when you're also, you know, a third grader is you want to watch yeah. TV and you want to like do the things that your friends are doing. And um, you didn't get good TV reception. So then we had a satellite mm -hmm. dish. I was going to say with, with solar that early in its kind of introduction, what were like some of the issues, I guess, that hadn't been worked out yet? Oh, I, you know what? I couldn't tell you everything, <laughs> but at yeah. the time, like photovoltaic was like a really big deal. And yeah, here's here's here here's how it got me into yoga, though. Um, my mom brought home a Jane Fonda workout video and the Raquel Welsh yoga video. I was actually a very sedentary kid. I was really into reading. I loved walking my dogs, but I just was not mm -hmm. an active kid, and I was really overweight. And in sixth grade, she brought these videotapes home and she wasn't in shape either, but we started doing these videotapes together. It was something that brought us together for two weeks and then she kind of mm -hmm. fizzled out. But I became absolutely obsessed with the tapes and I became obsessed with what I was feeling in my body because I had never had these feelings before. Mm -hmm. And what, what really began to happen is I started to... Um, spiral into a massive amount of weight loss and over-exercising, which we now know as orthorexia. So I was, a, I was an early adopter of an eating disorder at age 11, 12, and had a very unfortunate uh, origin story into yoga via mm -hmm. um, addiction. And But all along, one of the things that yoga did for me is it soothed me. So I grew up in a very chaotic you know, yeah. I mean, my parents, they did the best they could, but it was pretty chaotic. We had so many moves, yeah. so many divorces. And yoga was always there for me. My body was always there for me. I could stretch myself 
into oblivion, truly. Yeah. And that's really what I ended up doing because I, I also now know, looking back on all those decades, I'm a, I have a hypermob I'm on the hypermobility spectrum, and okay, so yeah. all that stretching uh, ended up truly destabilizing every joint in my body, and that also leads us into a whole further conversation about. <laughs> uh, fascia and connective tissue. So the, the yoga yeah. origin story was really me sort of mental health driven. Um, I was going to ask, it, was yeah. it more, I mean, of course you're going to get a culmination of mental, physical, emotional benefits from exercise, but I was wondering, yeah, was it, it sounds like it's more mental that, that really drew you in. Yeah. I mean, I, it wasn't, I mean, that's the thing. A lot of people think, oh, you know, anorexic, you're just, you're just trying to look a certain way. Yeah. No, I am trying to chase, run away from demons that are chasing me at all times, yeah. making me feel miserable. Um, I'm starving myself so that I don't have to feel my feelings. It mm. really wasn't about an aesthetic. In general, when people think about working out or even some forms of yoga, it's like, oh, wow, look at that body. But really, it wasn't about yeah. that. It was about the feeling body. Mm -hmm. Especially, and I think, I the long term. What people long term, the people that long term stick with something and that you know, are really at it on a day in, day out basis. It isn't for that temporary, you know, how do I look on spring break or, you know, can I lose the 20 pounds before my wedding or something like that, right? Oh my God, I'm like tearing up. In <laughs> That is hysterical. I know people, they do that, right? They work yeah. out for spring break or for, yeah, right. Okay. A very temporary no, nature. <laughs> my, my life was never about that, never. Of course, yeah. Yeah, so now we can kind of fast forward. We'll work, I guess, through your career, maybe a bit a little rewind. But you eventually, after years of experience, come out with, you know, your first book. And I guess to me, it's more, it seems like more than a book. It seems like a whole kind of method and, and uh, methodology, I guess, is the role method, right? So I guess... Role model. Role model. Yeah, it mm -hmm. is. Role model method. There you go. So give us the whole, I guess, broad outlook on, on what that is. And yeah, just take it away as if I know absolutely nothing. The role model is my approach to self-myofascial release. Self-myofascial mm -hmm. release is basically self-massage. Mm -hmm. And this is an approach to embody your body and to really learn the textures and tensions throughout your body, mm -hmm. which includes learning a little bit of anatomy, which includes you know joints, bones, muscles, and the fascial tissues that seam it all together. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's very interesting about working with your body is... Of course, the nervous system pervades everything. And mm -hmm. as you're rolling and doing things, well, your mobility and your joints and your motion gets better. But there's this other side effect that it also improves your range of emotion. You start to mm -hmm. be able to feel your feelings more accurately. You start to be able to pick up on more subtle sensing within your body. So when I originally wrote the, the role model, um, I knew that self-massage and self-myofascial release were indeed a rising trend. And this was something yeah. that I taught within my methodology. So when I was approached by my publisher, Victory Belt, um, they, they saw me doing a program with my friend Kelly Starrett, um, the founder of Mobility Wad, which is now the Ready State. And they saw me presenting on a webinar with him. I presented mm -hmm. on fascia and I presented on breath work. And they approached me and they said, we want, we want to publish your book. And I said, I don't have a book. They said, we'll write it and we'll publish it. So I had this golden egg placed in my lap. And yeah. what I wanted to write, Brock, the book I wanted to write is actually the book that we're talking, we're going to be talking now. about today, yeah. which is Body by yeah. Breath. But I knew that because for me, the most fascinating thing about the human body is respiration and all the benefits mm -hmm. that come along with it. But I knew that breath, this was 12 years ago when they approached me. Breath wasn't trending. I mean, it was in the yeah. yoga space. In my space, mean, it yeah. was, but not in your space. Not so in the I thought, yeah. I was like, you know what? I have this other thing that people love that we do that I teach, which is this rolling methodology. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I would really double down on that work and share out the role model method. It's spelled R O L L. And of mm -hmm. course, it's a plan, it's a word play because you really become your own embodied self care healer in that yeah. in that methodology in that approach um and so then as soon as i finished writing the role model they were like where's your next book and then that's when i knew i would start to write um this Chip book away at role that, model that, yeah did gotcha. so well it's been translated into five languages and wow. um, it has a life of its own we have 
uh, trainers that teach the work all over the planet. But really what I wanted to share out um, was this, <laughs> was body yeah. by breath. Yeah. So I kind of got like two questions and I guess you could answer them because they, they have a lot, I guess, within each one. So, you know, I can remind you what the second question was. But first off is I like that it, it seems to teach a lot more self-reliance or it just showcases what you can do with your own body through self-myofascial release and through mm -hmm. these different exercises instead of just relying on always using, which they obviously have their place, but using a, a physician or a physical therapist, it kind of teaches how you can release your body, learn your body, um, take more control back, I guess, of your body through mobilization, through movement, through exercise. And one of those tools, which is kind of question two, that I'd love to hear more about how these came about, but is some of the uh, products you sell through Tune Up Fitness. For example, these uh, massage balls, these therapy balls have been amazing. Um, I luckily, uh, you know, felt, or what do you call it? A, a colleague of us both, uh, Aaron, a uh, physical therapist, or yeah, massage therapist out of uh, Los Angeles. He sent me them years ago when I did some work for him. And uh, they've been a lifesaver for, for reference. They are softer than a lacrosse ball, harder than a tennis ball. They come in a variety of sizes, and they've just been a lifesaver for a lot of uh, lifters like myself, you know, want to roll out glutes or these, you know, knots in our backs and things like that from doing deadlifts or whatever it is, heavy lifting. And these are just perfect for, again, getting into those spots but not being too rough on them to where you can actually get the release. So I guess two questions. What do you think about self-reliance in, in that aspect and then two how'd you come up with this uh, concept or at least uh, help incorporate these uh, massage balls and other products i i think we are within a culture especially the united states where mm -hmm. our body is compartmentalized into uh, different medical specialties right yeah. so if you have an orthopedic problem you go to an orthopedist if you have a uh, mental health problem, you go to a psychiatrist. If you mm -hmm. have a, uh, a breathing problem, you go to a pulmonologist. You get the picture. Yeah. So we're really our, our we're we're drawn and quartered, and everybody gets their piece. But we don't necessarily understand the integration of it all. But we can. It's actually very easy to understand the integration of it all because it's 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 your being. Yeah. And and your so. One of the things that really always frustrated me was I just saw so many symptoms of my own were they were so interrelated. And it, yeah. it didn't make sense that it was just given to that diagnosis or to that clinician. One singular and, cause. Or, yeah. Yeah. And so, like, for example, <laughs> if I use myself as an example, mm -hmm. the the overstretching, the persistent overstretching yes. that I did <laughs> as a young yogini. Yeah. Uh, well, that was an orthopedic problem, right? But mm -hmm. no, it was actually a mental health problem that was creating. All I, I couldn't yeah. subdue this need to overstretch mm -hmm. because the, the stretching gave me such a release. And what was that release? It, then I need to study fascia to understand what was really happening there. So, um, so that's so. Th I think that's really a, a, an interesting thing for us to just ruminate on. I think it's really important to study parts and to study isolated stuff, mm -hmm. but you always have to go micro macro, micro macro. And what the therapy balls do is they really familiarize you with, I think I said this earlier, the textures of tension throughout your body. So mm -hmm. you really learn to map your own soft tissues and your own structures. And I think illuminating that map and, and when we're talking about mapping, we can go a uh, little neuroscience and go brain science here. We're, trying to illuminate our sensory motor homunculus, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the map within our brains that is helping us to understand proprioception, right? Where body parts are in space yeah. and our connection to those parts, how we can actually create contractile events in those different parts. So the therapy balls create a sensory motor relay in a very, very fast um, arousing manner. When I say arousing, mm -hmm. I don't mean like, oh my gosh, I'm all fidgety now. Yeah. It, it's arousing these these connections for us, and so that we can actually be better able to sense ourselves and move ourselves through space, so that we'll be less accident accident and injury prone. So the role model really is a way to you know injury proof yourself, but also to be able to sense your needs, like. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a word play on the word needs, K-N-E-A-D-S, as well as yeah. N-E-E-D-S. But to sense, you know, where it is, I might need some extra attention uh, 
in order to best do that lift or best do that move or make that run happen. So, um, you know, we settled, my husband and I as my business partner, you know, I was mm-hmm. doing rolling work before I met him. And when I met him, I just was this little, when I just this young, not young, I was in my early thirties, but I was just going from city to city. And yeah. I, I was using balls that you could buy at a drugstore. And he's like, you should brand those. You should make mm-hmm. your own and brand them. And so he helped me with that process. So then we get into the entrepreneur story now of yeah. why I settled on a particular grippy, squishy, pliable ball, uh, a particular rubber that we scale into three different sizes plus a larger air-filled, gushy, mm-hmm. gorgeous ball. Um, all of these tools have an incredible grip and pliable texture. Yeah, they're far now, if I can fast, yeah. Yes, because what they do is they can roll in and around bony prominences without creating irritation, bruising, or pinching, Mm -hmm. which a lacrosse ball has no yield. A lacrosse ball, most people don't know this, is made out of the same material as a bowling ball. Mm. So you're just basically scaling a bowling ball down to the size of a lacrosse ball, and you're covering it with rubber, and and you're good to go. But (laughs) the problem is, is it has no yield. And so if you're going to do pelvic floor work or footwork or or trying to address certain segments of your spine or even uh, smaller areas of the face or hands, mm-hmm. it's just too much pressure. Going into the belly of a muscle with a lacrosse ball, you can probably work your way with that. But if you're trying to get up into the valuable mechanoreceptors within joint junctions, mm-hmm. you really want to have something that can um, uh, absorb the, pro- the projections of your bony prominences mm-hmm. so that the ball can then do the grip work. So um, that's why we have these soft tools. And you know, I also wrote a chapter for a medical textbook called Fascia Function and Medical Applications, where I did a narrative review of, of all self-myofascial release mm-hmm. um, science. And uh, that took me a year. That took me a year out of actually writing Body by Breath to do that. But in that review, one of the biggest variables that uh, tool science hasn't really been looking at is hardness. But the, the few studies that are out there that are analyzing hardness all show that softer is superior because it disarms the muscle bracing response. Yeah. That muscle bracing response is your body's innate threat response. It's Your body's so smart at protecting itself. And so when mm-hmm. a hard object comes into soft tissue, your brain says, no, go there. And it freezes. It stiffens the tissue so that um, it's not injured. So these are almost like a Trojan horse. They kind of sneak in undetected. That's right. So you're rolling it. Basically, a lot of the discomfort you're feeling when you're rolling with lacrosse balls or rolling with hard foam rollers is you're actually feeling your own tension that you're rolling against. What what's ideal is to be able to create a therapeutic response by uh, dismantling that threat response. And and that brings us to everything that's in body by breath. Yeah, because body does, by breath does, yeah. really is about novel ways of, dis, of dismantling those unconscious um, chronic tensions that so many of us don't realize we're walking around with inside of our skin. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, drawing back to one of the first things you were talking about was I do think it's really unfortunate that we do uh, depend sometimes on so many of these different uh, professions or industries almost for our own health. Like uh, there's so many people that never get the time, never get take the opportunity, I guess, to learn their body, to learn what it's capable of, to understand, you know, like a lot of times I've worked with clients as a personal trainer on hip hinging. A lot of people, like you mentioned, don't have that awareness of how to actually move just their hips back, how to isolate a body part, how to, what does it mean? Like everyone knows how to flex their bicep. No one really, you know, a common person doesn't know how to flex their hamstring and isolate it or actually use their back rather than a bicep and a pulling movement. And it also extends to nutrition. You know, so many of us don't know actually what's what's good for us, right? We're just kind of trusting whatever we hear in a magazine, which could be completely wrong. And then, you know, it extends to other like intricacies too, like you mentioned breath, although it's not as mainstream, and it's certainly getting much more attention nowadays as it rightly should. But it's very underappreciated and underlooked at as far as, you know, we all have bodies, we all eat, we all have to move in this world. And a lot of people never get the uh, the know-how to actually maneuver in this world the best way they can, right? 
I I just hope that you know by writing a book called The Role Model, it yeah. <laughs> that that first um, helps put the power back into the, yeah, the people's bodies. Yeah. So because the better you know yourself, then you're going to be able to have more productive conversations with any provider, whether exactly. it's a personal trainer, yeah. whether it's an orthopedist, um, you know, whether it's a surgeon or 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 a, or a psychologist or, mm -hmm. or what have you. So I just want to bring the level of discourse higher than you know Shape Magazine. Like let's let's yeah. we can like we we people are smart, yeah. and I just want to keep raising that bar. So let's dig into the book itself, right? Um, the, the topic of the evening is uh, Body by Breath. So I want to, I guess, kick off with what was the inspiration for the book? Why breath? Why is this, you know, so important to you? I grew up in a household where my mother suffers and still suffers with mm -hmm. acute asthma. And I remember watching her struggle to breathe, watching her try to stay alive. And that'll really make a lasting impression. Yeah. on a nervous system and a human. Um, both my grandmothers died of COPD, uh, out of you know, breath-related diseases. Mm -hmm. So it's in my genetic line. And I didn't start this because I was trying to buffer myself against their, um, you know, their demise. Mm -hmm. But I definitely wanted to learn about it. And I definitely wanted to make sure that I could offset any relationship to, to, yeah. to that struggle. But I was also, when I was young, I was a singer. That was my true joy. And I remember being in fifth or sixth grade, and we didn't have a lot of money, but my mom managed to get me a singing lesson every week with a, a local teacher in the, in the solar community. Mm -hmm. And... I remember one day her addressing my breathing and teaching me about the diaphragm. And that was the first time I'd ever, you know, heard about that muscle. Mm. And it that made a lasting impression on me. And I also remember originally learned, when I learned about um, breathing or trying to control my breath vis-a-vis -vis singing, how difficult it was and how self-conscious my breath became once I started to shine a light on it. Mm -hmm. So all of these are just very interesting early memories for me about breathing mm -hmm. and definitely impacted the, the, the direction that, that I went in life and, you know, why it's so meaningful to me. Yeah. Well, like I, like I mentioned earlier, the, the book is incredibly comprehensive, full of valuable information, full of not just information, but practical exercises throughout so I'm just going to kind of, I guess, pick on certain points that, that stood out sure. to me and topics I'd love to expand on. One of those is the breath's impact on the nervous system and on our stress. Um, so I guess, how does the breath have an impact directly on that? Because a lot of times people just think of breathing, right? Normal, in, air in, air out, and they, they don't think about all the other byproducts, I guess, that happen from it. So I guess, how do those systems connect? And impact each oh other. my goodness! Well, you you don't have respiration without a brain that's directing the contraction of, course, yeah. of the respiratory diaphragm, and so your your whole body is very gas sensitive, mm -hmm. and your your body's just always trying to maintain itself within a a, a good zone of normal, mm -hmm. and so you know if you start to if your carbon dioxide levels start to rise, your brain is going to say, well, that's too much carbon dioxide, uh, got to bring in some more oxygen. And so it tells a nerve called the phrenic nerve to contract. The diaphragm listens and it mm -hmm. descends. And then air is sucked in either your mouth or your nose and your lungs inflate enough. There's enough dispersal of those gases into your bloodstream to normalize. And then the phrenic nerve stops contracting. And then suddenly there's a release of the tension in the diaphragm and out goes uh, other gases, CO2 and other other output yeah. gases. So, you know, just that, that basic uh, rhythm is happening all the time. That rhythm is also being generated. Uh, if we look more, uh, more nuclear into smaller mm -hmm. regions of the brain, there's this tiny area of the brain stem that was discovered by a, uh, a researcher named Dr. Jack Feldman, who lives not too far from here. <laughs> he, used to, he used to live two, uh, 1.3 miles from my house, and now oh, he wow. moved out 20 miles <laughs> um, down, yeah. down the freeway. Uh, but unbelievable researcher based at UCLA, he discovered this region of the brainstem called the pre-boxing complex. Mm -hmm. And his research showed that 
there's actually uh, these 5,000 or so neurons that end up creating a, a burst effect. And this is all related to the, the sensing of CO2 and whatnot, but they coordinate this rhythm that initiates inhalation. Mm -hmm. So we, we, are, we are constant because our brain is supporting the, the metabolic, the basic metabolic needs of oxygen in the yeah. body and making sure we're not overdosing on, on carbon dioxide. Um, but as it relates to uh, other aspects of the nervous yeah. system and distress specifically, um, the, the management of air is very relevant to the activities that you're doing physically, but also the internal environment, your emotional and physiological responses to activities that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So that activity might be listening to the podcast, which is not very stressful, or it may be listening to the latest um, news. We just had a, um, a horrible mass shooting saw, yeah. just 13 miles away from my home here in Monterey Park over, um, over, the, over the weekend. So you start, I mean, I just, now I have hair standing up on end, just even yeah. mentioning that. So our emotions also can change how we're breathing. So there's a yeah. complete intimate connection between respiration um, and um, then your, your nervous system. But what's super cool about breathing is that you can also consciously hijack any response and yeah. you can actually manipulate the way your body is responding through altering the length of your inhale, the length of your exhale, and the gaps in between inhale and exhale. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, some of the most common and, and easy to do practices are that you're just attempting to expand your exhale so that it's longer than your inhale, because typically exhales are extremely stress relieving um, mm -hmm. and it allows some of the parasympathetic aspects of your nervous system to come online. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other ways to manipulate and, and play around with inhale so that that can also happen. But basically, you can adjust the dial of your breathing to have a state change. That's yeah. just amazing. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's like simple built-in, I guess, cheat code to kind of hack into how you're feeling and how your body's responding to, like you, like you mentioned, kind of a stress uh, trigger or a circumstance, right? Mm -hmm. So another thing I wanted to dive into is, you know, what seemed to be all interconnected somewhat is uh, allostasis, homeostasis, and down regulation. So I don't know if you want to, I guess, break down how those all interconnect and how breath has a play with those. Oh, can we pass on that one? We can. <laughs> <laughs> but again, at least down regulation, I thought was very interesting because <laughs> as you kind of reference in the book, a lot of us were always like amped up and heightening ourselves up but we don't spend much time deregulating, uh, calming down, getting our, you know, our breath and our mind, giving it some peace. So I guess talk about the yeah. value of that. That's probably easier to get yeah. into rather than the science of that. Great. Yeah. So what I, what, one of the things I tend to see in my studio mm -hmm. or in my student population with people, people usually come to me because they have um, crises in their yeah. lives or in their bodies. They nobody's been able to figure out what's wrong with this, and they're like, I don't know. I heard about the the ball lady, and someone said try yeah. the ball lady, right? <laughs> and I mean, yeah. and there some people have re well researched me, and they're not just saying the ball lady. I do a yeah. lot of other things other than roll around on balls. Um, but one of the one of the heightened challenges that human population is dealing with right now is mm -hmm. an, a runaway train on anxiety. Um, all the indicators, especially over the past three years because of the pandemic and mm -hmm. lockdowns and isolation, um, is that uh, anxiety-related diseases are escalating at an in insane Crazy clip. pace, yeah. Crazy pace. And, um, and that our baseline of stress, the, just the human baseline of stress, it's just a, at a higher threshold for everybody. Yeah. So we're, we're all living in a more vigilant, stressed out state. And that really wears down all our longevity. Mm -hmm. it, it puts physical tension in our body. Um, it disturbs our sleep. Um, it makes things like panic attacks, 
uh, and uncontrolled rage is much more likely and much more frequent. Mm -hmm. um, and the mental health industry is going to have a real challenge keeping pace with this. But the, the movement-based industry, which you and I are in, mm -hmm. we can really help to adjust that allostatic load, that, that total sum uh, inputs mm -hmm. that our students and human beings are living with. And we can help adjust their stress thresholds by boosting their de-stress thresholds, by boosting their endurance for parasympathetic events. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? This is what the whole book is about, is novel ways of stimulating parasympathetic endurance. Why, why do we need parasympathetic endurance? Because we are in just outside stress endurance yeah, all the time all the time and yeah. <laughs> we're not matching that we're not improving our resiliency by getting by getting even faster by being even more productive mm -hmm. the way to actually boost the productivity if that's what you're after is to then dig yourself in on the other side of the stress spectrum into the relaxation response and really build your ability to tolerate yeah. being without being with less being with your feelings yeah. instead of running away from them. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who's stressed out has, you know, is running away from their feelings, yeah. but it's like you can't have subtle sensing when you're, when you're at 65 miles per hour all the time. You will eventually, especially as you keep accelerating, have a breakdown. So we really need to build our ability to go from 60 to zero without hitting the skids and without losing our transmission. Yeah, so all that made me really think about, honestly, is something a thought I had on my run yesterday was I noticed that I, I live a mostly uh, lower stress level life. I feel like I do a good job of managing my stress and I've, I've worked myself to these opportunities where I do have more flexibility being an entrepreneur with things in my life, but I am a bit of a workaholic. And so I can find myself just constantly filling all my time, not giving myself any free time, not giving myself any time to kind of bring things down and deregulate. And so whenever I do take something out of my, let's say my routine, so I don't have as much you know work to do and I, I try and stop myself from being that workaholic self, I end up naturally just filling something else in and I kind of keep this perpetual cycle of keeping my stress high, constantly go, go, go. And uh, it is just so important to take that time to deregulate, to almost force yourself, even if you don't want to, if you are that kind of workaholic person, force yourself to take time away, get outside, get away from technology. Because like you said, we do live in a society that's just perpetual with with external input, right? Just coming in constantly. So another interesting thing I noticed, or I noticed within the book, and I think I even, you, you did a post possibly recently about it as well, was uh, vacuums for uh, mm -hmm. your abdominal. And uh, I, I thought it was really interesting because I'm not sure how familiar you are with the whole bodybuilding community, but I'm, I'm sure you've seen, especially in the you know older generations, the vacuum pose, right? And uh, it's a great exercise for strengthening the transverse autonomous, for, for posing, obviously, for bodybuilders, diaphragm and all that. So I guess talk about how, I, I guess, your thoughts on performing vacuums for more than just the aesthetic of it. Well, this is really interesting because I'm going to have to break down some anatomy for Go you for and probably dispel some misinformation or uh, misunderstanding about yeah. the vacuum, um, which, you know, I, I, it's not like I've given up on people tag me all the time on influencers vacuum yeah. posts because there is so much anatomical discorrect information Wrong that stuff. It's, yeah. it's just, it's exhausting. <laughs> yeah. So in, in, in. In the, in the book, I actually tried to get a picture of Arnold doing the yeah, vacuum. vacuum. I used to waitress at his restaurant really? in yeah. Santa Monica cool. way back in the 90s when I first moved to L.A. because I speak German. And that was mm -hmm. the first job I got in Los Angeles was as a waitress in his restaurant. Not that we're buddies and not that yeah. he would ever remember <laughs> me. But I thought I did write out to his Instagram and I was like, hey, I used to waitress for yeah. you. I'm writing this book. And I'd love to them, you know, use your photo of the vacuum. <laughs> anyway, didn't happen. Maybe Arnold will maybe see this. Uh, yeah. Maybe next book. Maybe Arnold will see our podcast. Yeah. And, uh, and be like, oh, oh, shoot. <laughs> I should have given him my vacuum. Yeah. So the, the diaphragm vacuum also in social media now is called stomach vacuums, which yeah. couldn't be further from the truth. Because the, the, what I, I call it the diaphragm vacuum, because really it's a stretch of the respiratory diaphragm. And you get this stretch by 
uh, turning on the external intercostals. So when mm -hmm. you uh, contract the external intercostals, your both hemispheres of your rib cage they go into upward rotation. So you it creates a big barrel chest. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're without air, so you have to do this exercise. Yeah, after I was gonna say you can you can. You Correct me if I say this wrong, but essentially, from my understanding, it is yeah, you exhale and then you're, you know, for the mm -hmm. most common, keeping it as simple as possible, sucking in your stomach as kind of hard and high as you can up into your rib cage. Yeah, and that's where the that's where the incorrect information is because yeah. if you suck in your abdomen, you're contracting the abdomen. The diaphragm, yeah. the diaphragm moves because it's connected to the lower six ribs. So. When you do the exhalation, mm -hmm. then you broaden your rib cage. The diaphragm goes along for the ride. It can't help it. Um, but as it goes along for the ride, everything that it's connected to, all the way down to the pelvic floor, also is drawn apically. It's drawn north. It's drawn mm -hmm. towards, towards the vacuum. And so if I'm contracting my abdominals, then it will oppose the action of the diaphragm, and that will actually... Um, diminish the mobility of the diaphragm. So mm -hmm. you actually have to let your every layer of your abdominal muscles go totally slack. And it's not just your abdominal muscles. This is also all of your deep back muscles. It's what yeah. we often refer to in shorthand as the core. core your yeah. entire core, what I call the lining of your birthday suit, the yeah. li this is all going to get sucked up and in involuntarily. Mm -hmm. You don't have to actually help that move to happen. The help is in being able to control your intercostals. And then the secondary help is you being aware of whether or not you have unconscious tension within these different abdominal layers. And mm. that's where it gets very interesting for me because so many people have overtrained their abs or over stiffened their abs that the fascial tissues from layer to layer to layer have no glide. They don't mm. actually have mobility in north, south, east, west, northeast, southeast. They should have unbelievable pliability in multiple directions. That's why your lumbar spine is designed that way. Like we can mm. move like so cool. Um, but so many people, especially in, you know, Western culture, you, yeah. you grew up doing, you know, crunches and sit-ups were the way. But we have all these yeah. other ways um, that in 360 degrees that the core um, can move. So the diaphragm vacuum is such a great foundational exercise. I take, oh my gosh, probably 14 pages in the book to, yeah. um, uh, I mean, first there's chapters ahead of, before we even get to the vacuum so that you have the anatomical understanding yeah. and you have an, a little bit of understanding about um, fascial tissues and glide um, and the diaphragm. You have to know so much about the diaphragm. I mean, obviously you can just learn the, the vacuum without doing any of these things, but mm -hmm. it makes it such a, a richer experience. Yeah, it does. Yeah. You know, and then folks who have had any intra-abdominal surgeries, um, either with large scars or even, uh, you know, even tiny scar intra-abdominal surgeries, mm -hmm. they may also have a really difficult time with, with the allowing those tissues to have a normal stretch or a normal range of stretch. So um, I use the diaphragm vacuum as a really great diagnostic tool. And the reason, one of the other reasons why it's such a great diagnostic tool is the psychological ability for you to quote unquote, let go of your gut mm -hmm. is so difficult for so many people to experience complete relaxation in every layer of your abdomen. When you're used to bracing, you're used to getting ready to be humiliated or take a punch yeah. or, or be vigilant all the time. It's very difficult for many bodies to truly let go. So that that's that's where it gets really interesting for me. Yeah, you, I mean, I feel like with any of this stuff, you could go in a rabbit hole. So I appreciate the in-depth information you share. And I, I, it's probably a late disclaimer, but disclaimer for anyone, it's best to just get her book and then you'll understand all the concepts a lot better, right? <laughs> Obviously, I mean, we, I mean, like that, that, and then I've done tons of free instructional stuff videos on our website yeah. and YouTube, mm -hmm. like. You can try to piece some of this stuff together in little yeah. clips here and there, um, but the book is the first time that I've ever put and all, in all one of place. the information all in one place yeah. so that I can refer people to it and they can really get the education. And then the second thing is then come to class so that I can spy on, spy yeah. on you and be a fly on the wall and give you some coaching or with any of our trainers worldwide yeah. who teach this work. Yeah. So this next question is very uh, personal to me and I'm excited to ask it. 
is uh, I'm sure you might have heard of it in the past, but Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome. And so that's something I, uh, I haven't had formally diagnosed, but I've had multiple experiences of it for the past like six years in specific moments, uh, specifically in like marathon race. I had it and uh, when I ran my first marathon in Richmond, Virginia. And um, it's, it's, you know, basically this, this rapid, for those who don't know, it's this rapid spike of heart rate. Um, sometimes it's not even during exercise. Sometimes it can just be uh, sitting in a chair and I stand up too quickly or I kind of like skip a breath and it, it just basically it's this extra nerve um, that is triggering a signal to my heart, kickstarting my heart rate. And my breath doesn't really get that high. I'm breathing maybe the norm, you know, as normal as I would be, but my heart rate is beating at, you know, close to 200 beats per minute. And obviously when you're running or you're exercising, this can be a, uh, a, a bad struggle to deal with if you got, you know, 15 more miles to run. So how does, what is your experience with that syndrome? And it obviously, it, or it has a huge impact on the vagus nerve is what I've learned. And I've tried to use some of those vagus valgus maneuvers to control it. Uh, I guess, take it away. What are your whole thoughts on that whole conundrum? And what, what could I do to, I guess, make sure it stays away? Well, so I actually didn't have a, an awareness of the specific term for that syndrome. Yeah. I just know it as tachycardia. Mm -hmm. So you get these tachycardias, um, mm -hmm. f f you know, uh, without any warning. And suddenly yeah, you've exactly. got this insane um, racing heart. Um, I, in, this is not something that I've ever experienced in, in my own mm -hmm. body. I do have uh, a, a small handful of clients with tachycardias. Mm -hmm. And really what we work on is just an overall um, parasympathetic resilience plan. And that is to stockpile a number of practices that you know help deeply relax you and deeply sedate you that yeah. you can call on, on in, in, in any environment when these tachycardias would show up. So for example, um, you know, like, I guess, for example, if you're you know seated in an airplane and one of these tachycardias yep. happened to you and you're you're literally frozen in the seat, there's not a lot of options. Mm -hmm. um, I would want to. I would first of all, I'd have a million questions for you about <laughs> a lot of different things. So I don't yeah. want to diagnose you. I mean, not like not that I'm dying. You've already yeah, diagnosed yeah. yourself. Um, yeah. But I'd want to really experiment with a lot of. First of all, I'd get an intake of well, what are the things that you have found help to then quell these yeah. rapid onsets. Yeah, That's a what lot I of it. Know first. Yeah, a lot of it is what you talked about. So, I uh, one of my clients back in Virginia uh, worked with her for years. She was actually a heart surgeon, and so she was giving me some advice as far as uh, using this vagus valgus maneuver. Where basically, what they've found, I think, it's it first came about from some research. I think like the mid two thousands, but it, it's basically you almost want to either use a thumb or if you had like a, almost act like it's a straw, use a finger and brace down, hunker down, and blow as hard as you can for kind of as long as you comfortably can uh, against there. And that's supposed to trigger the the nerve. Mm -hmm. And uh, because what's happening with mine specifically, as you mentioned, the broad term is tachycardia. And when I was first Googling, like, what's going on with me? If you just look up fast heart rate, that's all that comes up. And it'll say, right. you know, uh, poor exercise, smoking, all these different things. I'm like, I know that's not what's causing mine. And uh, th there's a, essentially a, a couple different uh, syndromes that all have the same response to where uh, mine specifically, there's this extra pathway and this extra mm -hmm. pathway gets triggered by whatever sends the extra nerve. So that's what triggers mine. Um, it is almost completely random. Like I said, the only instance I can tell that it's going to come up is if I have some issue or if I like skip a breath, you know, or, or if I like uh, choke on my spit, right. And that interrupts a breath to the point of, uh, to your point about how do I quell it is, other than that maneuver it, and tied to it is, like you mentioned, trying to calm myself down, taking big, slow exhales. And I usually have to go through a number of rounds to do this. If I'm not exercising, I can two breaths, two deep, slow breaths. I'm good. It's back to normal. But if I'm Amazing. exercising, yeah. my heart rate's already elevated. That's the problem. And I was very yeah. nervous. I, I ran my first ultra marathon. It was a 50 miler in October. And I was very nervous because I was like, if this triggers at any point, I have like 30 more miles to go. And what happens is if I can't calm it down, um, not only is it concerning about you know, if I have a heart condition issue, but also uh, it, it drains you like no other because your body is obviously pumping so fast. Um, so 
long story, but in, in short, using that maneuver and then also like you mentioned and like this whole book is about controlling your breath and uh, trying to use some of these breathing techniques that you, uh, you even reference in your book. Great. So that's thank you for for filling out some of the of the blanks for me and especially describing yeah. that maneuver. So in the book, almost all of these, uh, exercises are targeted to try to arouse the vagus nerve, like you described. Yeah. We do have actually some expiratory toning exercises where we use the cordless ball as a resistive elastic and we have the tiny straw, we blow mm -hmm. into the cordless ball. And so that would be in, in a way similar to some of the part of the exercise, the, the Valsalva exercise that you were taught. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's also other uh, mechanical portals to stimulating the vagus that we do. One of the simplest mechanical portals that can be done like pretty much anywhere unless you're stuck on an airplane seat is mm -hmm. to get your pelvis higher than your head. So you would lay down on the ground, raise your pelvis up on a block or a stack of books, or we like to mm -hmm. do it on top of a gorgeous ball, which brings your heart higher than your brain. And as soon as that position happens, and by the way, you can do that by also slumping forward in your plane seat. And again, your, your brain would be below your heart. And mm -hmm. what happens with that is your, your brain is very invested in only having a certain amount of blood in it. And mm -hmm. you have these two really big uh, arteries and veins alongside the side of your neck, yeah. we, the carotid artery and the jugular vein. And, and nestled along with those two arteries is a nerve sheath. And inside that nerve sheath happens to be the vagus nerve, by the way. So when you're in the position of... In the book, we call it gentle slope, but it's basically mm -hmm. a recline, an elevated recline position. Um, blood goes towards gravity. And so Rushes your head. when your head yeah. is below your heart, those the, the, the pressure sensors in the carotid sense that there's too much blood coming to the brain. Something has to be done here. And there's a very quick feedback loop from the vagus nerve to the brain stem that all of a sudden constricts the arteries. It slows down the breath rate and it mm -hmm. slows down the heart rate. And so that's a way to activate the vagus is to uh, take advantage of what's called the barorecept baroreceptor reflex. So that's one of the things that I would suggest if, if yeah. the space allows you to do that, if the environment allows you to do that. Um, and then the other, other many things that you can do to stimulate um, the vagus is through uh, actually palpating it mm -hmm. by pressurizing against it. And so you can actually take your hand and stroke along the side of your neck. And we do this with the cordless ball, we'll rub it back and forth, but yeah. you can't see me um, if you're listening to this podcast, but I'm just taking my, the, my, my full palm and I'm, I'm, I'm moving it from my throat. Is there a specific putting, spot you're looking at or just well, in general rubbing that the, section? Rubbing that section and putting pressure okay. against it, that's where the carotid, the jugular, and the vagus yeah, that's where are they're all alive, in, yeah. entwined. And so doing pressure there can also stimulate the vagus. Um, also, pressure on the actual, I know this sounds crazy, but pressure on the actual aorta, mm -hmm. um, doing contract, relax breath work. That's inhale, hold your breath, contract, which is similar mm -hmm. to that Valsalva. Um, and we do that with the cordless ball on the chest. In to, I mean, it helps the lungs, but it also yeah. um, can stimulate the, um, the pressure sensors there in the aortic notch, um, mm -hmm. which is co innervated by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. And then we also can do gut rolling. When we do cordless ball rolling in the abdomen, we're squishing around in the land of the vagus nerve, which is your digestive organs. And mm -hmm. that, that is a way of actually really building um, a parasympathetic response. So uh, what I would, I would probably do is I would mainline some of the parasympathetic practices so that mm -hmm. I could call upon them in different circumstances, depending on the environment and the timing and, and all of that. Yeah. In addition to taking longer exhales than it is. Yeah, kind of putting together a little toolkit for an emergency plan kit. So it sounds like I just need to lay upside down on the trails whenever it uh, occurs, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, well, there's a lot of thorns on that trail, yeah. but better to be bloody than to, <laughs> exactly. you know, have a heart attack, right? Yeah. So I don't want to take up too much of your time. So I got one more question for you. And uh, so all this great information. Uh, but as, as I'm sure you know, and as we come to expect, a lot of times people just want like a quick trick, right? So I guess what is one kind of universal or, or, or your favorite kind of breathing technique that, you know, someone can apply today and, 
and get started with breath? I, well, I think we could do the Brock special. So the Brock yeah. special would be the internal metronome breath. And that is you'll prop your pelvis up on an object like, yeah. uh, right? like, a, like a ball or a block uh -huh. or a couch cushion and let your rib cage and your head rest on the floor. And then you'll create a little loop with both fingers, that, which is going to create the little OK symbol. Okay. And this is the internal metronome. Your attention is going to go to your fingertips and you're, you'll start to sense your heart rate there. So this, mm -hmm. this takes us into one of the aspects of the book. We talk about interoception, physiological listening. And once you get a sense of your heart rate, then you'll do a breath pattern of inhale for a count of six heartbeats, mm -hmm. hold for four heartbeats, exhale for eight heartbeats, and hold for four heartbeats while you're in that gentle slope. Inhale six, hold four, exhale eight, hold four. And this takes you completely out of tech. This brings you into literal insight. You will be feeling your own breath's pace along with your heart rate, and mm -hmm. you're going to be compounding this baroreceptor reflex and also obviously doing a breath exercise so we can get lots of different features in uh, of body by breath in this one move. And I'm telling you, like if you had a, a bad conversation or you had a, you know, your kids are about to come home, <laughs> give yourself those three minutes, yeah, three to five minutes. And it's a, it's a complete palate cleanser. Yeah. I'm going to have to play that back and, and write that down because now there's no excuse for me or, or anybody listening to, uh, to not give this a go. I like that. So Jill, where can people find you in the book specifically? I know is it comes out right at the end of February. February 28th, yes. Yeah. And it's, but the book is on Amazon. It is a yeah. hardback. It is a textbook, mm -hmm. um, but it is also user-friendly. I wrote it so that my mother could understand it, but I mm -hmm. also wrote it so that clinicians would feel really confident um, prescribing the book for yeah. all of their, their, their clients. So you can find that on Amazon. My website's tuneupfitness.com. We also have mm -hmm. a Body by Breath website. If you're just, I just want to know about the book, tell me more. Tell mm -hmm. me more than this on Amazon. Go to the Body by Breath website. That'll inform you. I am also on Instagram as the Jill Miller, T-H-E, Jill Miller. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, our brand has a page, Tune Up Fitness. But I, I do love interacting with students. I love sharing this work in person. Mm -hmm. And I have a very robust book tour coming up. Yeah, starting yeah. At, starting literally the day the, in the two days after um, the book launches. So I will be in Northern California. At, uh, I'll be in Texas. I'll be in Georgia. I'll be in Canada. I will be in Washington D.C., New York, um, Boston, and and Southern California. So I'll be all over the place. And then Go I'll be online. Her. We'll yeah. be doing a three day <laughs> webinar. Uh, excuse me, a three day body by breath training. Okay. which is a training that I developed when I started writing the book. So we yeah. have been leading this training for uh, eight years, and it is incredibly important for professionals to get these tools in their toolkit so they can help clients like Brock um, mm -hmm. who present as completely healthy and normal, but then they have these random, strange, rapid heart rate uh, mm -hmm. things that you feel completely at a loss to help them with. But there are so many people like Brock out there um, yeah. <laughs> you know, the special, but everybody needs to, everyone can benefit from it. Yeah. More parasympathetic yeah. practices to build yeah. resiliency. Absolutely. Well, like you mentioned earlier, again, like the, as I've read it myself, the book is easy to read. So you don't stress if you, you know, some of this sounds technical, confusing, there's plenty of graphics and diagrams and, you know, you even reference different, uh, sources like Huberman's podcast and things like mm -hmm. that, which I think is really helpful. Uh, but yeah, so ch definitely check her out. Pick up both books if you can. Maybe get get some kind of uh, yeah. Treat yourself in both ways with the breath and the body and the movement and uh, the role uh, model method. And if you have any questions, definitely uh, contact Jill. She's always helpful and gracious to answer. And uh, we'll catch you guys in the next one.